Welcome to the Keto Geek Podcast. Let's do this. Health, nutrition, fitness, low-carb lifestyle. Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to the Keto Geek Podcast. My name is Fahad, and I'm the host of this show. I actually have some big news for you all. Our chocolate fudge energy pod is now on Amazon. We just did a soft launch for it. We blasted our newsletter and social media basically everywhere. So if you support our product, our message, our articles, everything we do, please go there and check out our product and buy it, hopefully, and leave us a review. Let's get our product all the way to the top on Amazon. That would be really cool. And just as a soft launch deal, we have discounted our Chocolate Fudge Energy Pod 15% or about $5 from its retail price. So we just wanted to make it even sweeter for you. No puns intended. Um, So besides that, uh, I will be going to Hungary in April, which is about a couple of weeks from now, and attending the open house by Paleo Medicina. It will take place on April 5th to 7th. I think their last day for registration is March 25th, and the link is going to be in the show notes as well. So if you are interested in the Paleolithic ketogenic diet, please check them out. We already had Zofia Clemens on our show. She's really cool. Her team's doing an amazing work over there, and they're going to have people like Dr. Thomas Seafried and Amber O'Hearn, who have been on our show too. So check it out. They have online live streaming there too on their website. And it'll be a fun event. Really cool. Something new to look forward to, especially if you're curious about the carnivorous diet. And speaking of the carnivorous diet, we have been experimenting with a lot of dry aged beef products, sort of like a jerky, biltong, all those kind of things. And I had quoted or mentioned some stuff to Rafi in our Nutty Carnivore group, and he recommended that I reach out to Tucker Goodrich and talk about fats. And that is how I got to the great person that we have today on our show, um, because I was I also had a hunch. I mean, not all fats could be the same. I mean, omega-6s, omega-3s, all those kind of things need to be different. They I was just curious about it. And how are they different from each other? How do they impact the body? So I think Tucker has a great thought process, and he is a really smart guy. But who exactly is he? Just to give you guys a little bit of his bio, Tucker is a technology executive in the financial industry who designs, runs, and debugs debugs complex systems. He started using the same approach for his own health after dealing with a couple of medical issues and realizing that the solutions offered by medical professionals weren't working or addressing root causes. You know, I think that's a bit of an underwhelming introduction for what you guys are about to hear next. My mind was blown midway and by the end of this show because he talks about so many things that I had no idea about. So strap on your boots and have a joyful joyride with Tucker Goodrich. Tucker? Would you like to explain to people where you are right now and what's up with being outside of Starbucks? Yeah, so that's kind of a funny story. So we just had one of our, I live in Connecticut, and we just had one of our periodic nor'easters. And in Connecticut, we have lots of trees and lots of granite. And as a result, they can't put the power lines underground. And every time we have a windstorm, the trees all knock the power lines down. So at the moment, there is a power company repair crew in front of my house trying to get the power back on. So I evacuated here in front of a Starbucks where I can get free Wi-Fi. So I am sitting in my car. (laughs) Um, And that's how you do the podcast. (laughs) So I guess I'm podcasting as a refugee. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. All right, let's, uh, let's get back to the normal state of things for the podcast. Um, first question, how did you get into low carb keto, this whole madness? Um, 
entirely by accident is the short answer. Um, okay, so let me let me start from the beginning. When I was a kid, I had a lot of dental problems. Cavities had a bunch of teeth pulled, right? When I was probably 18 years old, I finally listened to one of my dentists and I cut sugar out of my diet. No more cavities, right? So I was primed for the diet can be a solution thing, but I was basically eating the sad, I referred to myself as Mr. Whole Wheat, God help me, um, and thought I was doing everything right. I had a couple of, a series of serious intestinal diseases over the years. And after the first one developed chronic diarrhea and started putting weight on the typical pound a year. So, you know, 20 years later, I was 20 pounds overweight or roughly 20 years later. Um, right. So when I was 38, I had what at first appeared to be a stroke, um, which put me in a st stroke ward for for four days, I was unable to see, I was unable to speak. Uh, luckily I had a guy who was working with me who was an emergency medical technician who diagnosed me as having a stroke and took me to the hospital. There was a local medical university that had a excellent stroke department. So he took me there. Um, they couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, so, you know, four days later they let me go. Um, Two years after that, I had an attack of acute diverticulitis, which means uh, your col acute diverticulitis means your colon is perforated, right? You now have a hole in your colon and the contents of your colon are leaking out into your intestine. This was incredibly painful. Um, so I wound up with another four days in the hospital with a doctor who was explaining to me that I was likely going to have to have a piece of my colon cut out to resolve this situation, um, which six months later is ultimately what wound up happening. Um, two years after that, a fellow by the name of Justin Owings, um, who runs a barefoot running website of all things, sent me a link to Stefan Guyane's blog, Whole Health Source. Um, and it you know, entirely randomly, it was something about how dental problems were the result of diet and not genetics, as I'd always understood. And I read these posts and I was just like, this is incredible. You know, as somebody who hated, hates dentists and yet had serious dental problems and then resolved them through diet, um, I, was, I was receptive to this. And I followed Stefan's blog for probably five or six months, um, reading following all the links, reading all the studies he posted, because initially what he was posting was so incredible to me. I had to, you know, I had to check what it was based on. Right. Um, at the time I was the chief technology officer for a large New York city hedge fund, um, and largely self-taught in technology. So I was kind of in the business of solving complicated problems and doing all the research that was necessary to allow me to come to a cor correct conclusion about what was the cause. So I just applied the same approach to the diet information that I would professionally. Um, so one day I walked down to the cafeteria at work and I looked at the salad bar and the salad dressings at the salad bar. And I said to myself, you know, Stefan had gone on about a couple of different topics and one of them was industrial seed oils. And I looked at these things and I said, you know what, these are probably the worst, crappiest ingredients that they can, cause it was not a great cafeteria. Um, I was like, these are probably the worst, crappiest ingredients that they can put in a squeeze jar. And Right then and there, I said, you know what, I'm going to just I'm going to try not eating these anymore and see what happens. So this was two years after I'd had the diverticulitis. At that point, I had been sick with intestinal issues for 16 years. Right. I had come to the conclusion that it was just part of getting old. That's what my doctors told me. Uh, they told me the surgery that I had would be curative. It was not. Um, so I said, okay, I'm going to cut this out of my diet and I'm going to see what happens. Two days later, two days, 
my 16 years of bowel disease resolved, which absolutely blew my mind, right? How could that, how could it be that simple? How could it possibly be that simple? And I have an email that I sent to Stefan shortly after that saying, you know, this is unbelievable. I've been sick for all this time. I make this minor change and, you know, I'm better. Now, what I also found interesting, um, I had tried going low carb a couple of times to lose weight. Um, I mean, I was very active. You know, I would go to the gym after work, work out for an hour, and then go mountain biking for two hours at night with a headlamp, right? So I was getting, you know, something on the order of 15 to 18 hours of exercise a week. And you can probably answer the question, how much weight did I lose with all that exercise? None. <laughs> Not a pound ever, right? Um, so I tried various, I tried cutting calories, didn't work. I tried going low carb, it didn't work. I kept craving carbohydrates. Um, after I dropped the seed oils from my diet, I realized like five or six days later, I hadn't eaten any carbohydrates. I just forgot. I didn't have any desire to. Um, and that was sort of the next phase of my diet because, you know, I thought Steve Stefan's blog was very compelling, but he kept going on about how um, harmful wheat was. And as I mentioned before, I referred to myself as Mr. Whole Wheat. Well, I'd basically forgotten to eat any wheat for a week. And then on fr Friday came around and I decided to go down to the cafeteria again and have a sandwich. And after I ate the bread, I thought I was having a heart attack. My heart was racing, my head was pounding. I had to lie down on the sofa at work for a little while to recover. Um, at which point I thought, I thought Stefan was crazy going on about this stuff. And I was like, oh my God, am I one of these people? <laughs> so now I, now I went into diagnosis mode, right? I was like, okay, clearly cutting the seed oils had an immediate impact. I'm gonna continue that. But what is going on with the wheat? Why did I have this reaction to having a sandwich? So I explicitly cut out wheat for the following week. And then the following Friday, some of the guys I shared the office with ordered, a, ordered pizza. I had a couple of slices of pizza and an even more violent reaction. So I very, very quickly realized, okay, I have a wheat problem. In talking with family members, it turned out that it ran in the family. My mother also years before had said she had a problem, but she was always into these wacky diet things. So I sort of discounted the whole thing. Oops, my bad. Um, so it was just at that point, it became a matter, a matter of trial and error. Um, my health improved so rapidly that people, you know, my wife at the time noticed immediately. I dropped all of my excess weight in two months. Um, I dropped, you know, visually probably 15, 20 years of age. I started getting carded again when I went to buy alcohol, right? Um, one morning I put on my pants, uh, buckled my belt, let go, and they dropped to the floor. So at that point I had to take all my clothes to get them tailored because they didn't fit anymore. I was like, you know, it was fabulous. <laughs> but why had this all happened, right? All of this went, you know, I was like, I followed the food pyramid. I thought the experts knew what they were talking about. Why, why did turning it all on its head solve all of my health issues? And not just the, not just the weight, the weight would have been nice. But I mean, I was, I'd been sick for 16 years. Afterwards, I started experimenting with, um, I discovered that the cause of what I had thought was initially a stroke and then the diagnosis was changed to a migraine was a gluten sensitivity. So now if I eat gluten, I have probably a 70% chance of losing my vision and losing my ability to speak and understand language, which is a fairly significant effect of food. So yes, it got, that managed to get my attention fairly dramatically. And being curious, I decided to 
you know, I started doing research, trying to figure out research, meaning reading and trial and error on myself and on my family, trying to figure out what was going on and what were the triggers. Awesome. So you sort of ended up keto by that method turned out to be or low carb. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I lost, I didn't have any intention to start being keto. Right. I didn't get into it that way. I got into it because Stefan had some fairly compelling posts about seed oils and cancer and, you know, skin problems. I had, I was extremely sun sensitive to sunburn. I mean, I don't know if our viewers are going to be able to compare our complexions. <laughs> <laughs> I am blonde and fair skinned and would turn into a tomato after 45 minutes in the sun. Um, one of the most amazing things that happened shortly after I changed my diet is I became resistant to sunburn for the first time in my life. Right. And my wife's, my ex-wife's complexion is similar to yours. So probably five, four or five weeks after I changed my diet, we went to this event in Central Park in New York City. And the two of us stood out in the sun side by side for two and a half hours, right? We got, you know, for the listeners, if uh, they're not familiar with Fahad's complexion, he looks like somebody who evolved to be in the sun, unlike myself. Um, so I'm standing there next to my ex-wife and two and a half hours, we get home and she says to me, she says, look at the sunburn I got. And I turned to her and I said, look at me, I didn't burn. And she was like, oh my God, that's incredible. Now I remembered a post that had been on Mark Sisson's blog that I had read about a guy who fixed his diet, went primal and discovered he, was, he didn't burn as easily. So it was like, my head was primed for this fact. Um, and I mean, at this point, I haven't used sunscreen. The only time I use sunscreen is when I go up into the high alpine regions, but even then, it takes probably six or seven hours for me to burn, as opposed to 45 minutes at sea level. Do you know why so that is so? The evidence I have seen suggests that it's from the seed oils, that they change the membrane composition of certain key, you know, both your skin and your eyes are composed of fatty acids. And when the composition of the fatty acids change, omega-6 fatty acids are extremely susceptible to oxidization by either ultraviolet light or blue light, right? So, and when they are oxidized, they turn into toxins. And there's some pretty good evidence that the toxins are the cause of what I will call non-reactive sunburn, right? Reactive sunburn is where what happens to me now and what probably happens to you, you go out in the sun and you get a little pink and then you wake up the next morning and you're darker, right? That's what's supposed to happen because we evolved under the sun, right? What would happen to me is I would go out in the sun for 45 minutes and what I suspect is the omega-6 fats that my body was saturated with would oxidize, turn into these toxins, and create this severe inflammatory response in my skin. Okay. Um, right? Changing that took weeks. I mean, it wasn't a long time. And the evidence, you know, the papers that I've seen say changing body, depending on the tissues, the composition of your tissues can change in weeks, depending on the fatty acid composition of your diet. Wow. Okay. Right. You've opened up a can of worms here. <laughs> Interesting. Go on. It's a can of worms. Um, so, so let's, let's just back out a little bit. Let me set a little bit of groundwork here. Um, The biggest um, change that's happened in the human diet over the last 140, 50 years has been the emergence of what I'll call seed oils, what people typically call vegetable oils, right? 
in order to make seed oils, you basically have to extract. I mean, if you look at corn, right? Corn doesn't, if you look at a corn kernel, it's not a particularly fatty thing, right? It's not like butter, which is obviously mostly made of fat. In order to get the oils out of seeds like corn or soybeans, you have to use, you know, the very fatty ones, you can squeeze it out. Um, but most of them, you have to use some sort of industrial process to extract them, right? They use uh, solvents like hexane to remove the oils from these seeds. <clears throat> um, so if you look at the change in the human diet and the American diet, let's just limit it over the last hundred years, the single biggest change has been a 1,000 fold rise in the amount of omega-6 fats in the human diet, right? Okay, single biggest change. If you look at like carbohydrates 100 years ago, they were about as high as they were now. Fats were a little bit lower, meats were a little bit higher, no dramatic changes except for this thousand fold increase in seed oils in the human diet, right? So set the stage, it's been a huge change in the human diet. Um, if you start looking in the research, you know, the epidemiology, there are a couple of changes that are associated with that early on. The first was the rise of cancer, right? Second was the rise of heart disease. If you look at animal models of cancer, if, right, so, you know, poor rats live in labs, doc, scientists try and give them cancer and figure out how to cure it. Scientists say that if you can't give a rat cancer and cure its cancer, you don't deserve to have a PhD. So they've pretty much got it sussed out what happens with the rats in the lab. Now, one of the fascinating things is if a rat in a lab doesn't get any omega-6 fats, it cannot get cancer. You can give it carcinogens, but it won't get cancer, right? The cancer-causing capacity of the rat is increased by the amount of omega-6 fats it gets in the diet up to about 4.4% of energy, after which point the effect maxes out, right? Giving it additional doesn't make a difference, right? So we have a clear demonstration that there's a relationship between these particular fats and health, right? Um, if you look at the, epi the human epidemiology, non, so there's a great paper that looks at the rate of breast cancer in Asian women and in Asia eating traditional diets and an Asian woman who moved to the United States, right? They have a, I think it's a seven times increase in the rate of breast cancer after they moved to the United States. Can't be genetic. It's unlikely to be environmental except for, you know, because, I mean, just because you move from China to America, what's going to change in your environment, right? There's, but it's multiple countries. It's not just one country, right? Um, so, you know, Stefan started with a lot of this stuff in his blog, these links between skin cancer and, you know, the animal cancer studies. They're all stuff that I learned from him. Um Then there are other connections. There's, you know, one of the other things that happened shortly after seed oils were introduced in the United States was we had an epidemic of cardiovascular disease. Um, that is a fairly interesting story. One of the effects, one of the clear effects that seed oils have on a human body is they reduce LDL cholesterol, right? And as all of us know, LDL cholesterol is the great evil in human health. Um, that's a joke, by the way. So one of the things that seed oils do, do is they reduce LDL cholesterol. So they did a bunch of studies over in the 50s and I think the 40s, 50s and 60s looking at what happens if you add seed oils to a human diet, right? Does it have an effect on cardiovascular disease? Problem with those studies is they assumed that if LDL cholesterol went down, it would improve cardiovascular disease, right? And it does reliably lower LDL cholesterol, no doubt about that. But the problem was they never looked 
in two of these studies, uh, the Sydney Diet Heart Study and a Minnesota study that was led by Ansel Keys, they fed people high amounts of seed oils for a good period of time, but they didn't track the endpoints, right? They looked at LDL cholesterol, which went down, and they just assumed that it would result in improved health but they didn't actually report on what happened with cardiovascular disease and death. So a researcher, uh, Christopher Ramsden, who works for the National Institutes of Health um, in the alcohol division, which is an interesting, another story, went back and was able to find the original data from these studies and reanalyze it and find that they did actually keep track of the endpoints, right? And so he wrote two papers in the last few years that reported what actually happens. Well, cardiovascular disease goes up when you give, when you increase people's seed oils, right? Their cholesterol goes down, but their disease goes up and the mortality rates go up. So that's interesting. There's a classic study done by an Indian researcher. Um, his last name's Malhotra. And I can't remember his first name. Asim? Um, Asim? No. no Asim that Malhotra one. is the guy who's alive now, the cardiologist in England. This fellow published in the 60s and 70s. And he was the head of the Indian railroad workers health system, right? Which was one of the biggest early epidemiological studies. He had a thousand people participating in his health system. And they kept good records of what happened to people. And they, so he went back and he, he went, when the diet heart hypothesis that saturated fat causes heart disease comes out, he said, well, I've got this big country, diverse population. Um, you know, I don't know how many people there were in India at the time, but it was probably in the order of 500 million people and a million of them were under his care. They all had to use his hospital systems and his doctors, so we had a pretty good set of records. So he said, okay, let's look at what happens, you know, does saturated fat cause heart disease in the um, patients that I'm responsible for? And what he found was there was a big dichotomy in diet between northern Indians and southern Indians. The northern Indians ate a lot of dairy, and some of them ate a fair bit of meat. Southern Indians ate a lot of carbohydrates, not a lot of dairy. Most of the fats that they got, they were on a low fat diet, but most of the fats that they got were from seed oils, right? What he discovered was the di discrepancy in heart disease rates between the Northern Indians and the Southern Indians. The Southern Indians on something that looked like a healthy food pyramid diet, high carbohydrate, low meat, low fat, but mostly from polyunsaturated fats, had 15 times the rate of heart disease as the northern Indians who were eating saturated fat full dairy and some amount of meat, right? Huge difference. Now, if you know, you know, in epidemiology, there's what's known as the Hill criteria, which is uh, named for Bradford Hill, the fellow who discovered that... Um, there was epidemiological evidence for tobacco causing lung cancer, which is something we now take for granted. But most people don't realize that that was never really experimentally proven. It started with epidemiological evidence. You know, there was, if you smoked, you were 20 times as likely to get lung cancer as if you didn't smoke. That's a pretty good risk rate, right? Um, we have a similar rate for a high carb, low fat, high PUFA diet a similar increase, 15 times more than people who are eating a high saturated fat, high, high dairy diet. So we have a number of these different epidemiological and experimental, you know, indications, let's call it, because I don't want to go crazy out on a limb, that there's something wrong with this big increase in seed oils in the diet. By now, you must have some questions, because I I need to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you're on a tear, go for it. If you have anything else to add, I can, I'm listening to the story. This is like story time with Tucker. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
One of the questions that I have to kind of backtrack is what's going on? Why omega-6 or seed oils are just causing this chain reaction? Is there like biochemistry going on over there? Like, Is it causing mitochondrial damage that leads to cancer? Is it going into the bloodstream and just annihilating stuff? What's up? That's an excellent question. Um, so as I mentioned before, composition of your the tissues in the body pretty closely follows what fatty acids you eat in your diet right um notably in the mitochondria there's a structure there's a molecule called cardiolipin which is composed of four fatty acids right and the fatty acids to large to a large extent except in the brain are controlled by what you're eating, right? And it changes in weeks, right? Based on what you're eating. Um, now, cardiolipin, so if you eat, for reasons we don't entirely understand, if you eat a lot of omega-6 fats from seed oils, it contains a fat called linoleic acid. For reasons we don't entirely understand, if you do that, you're body converts most cardiolipin to contain linoleic acid, right? So you wind up with what you call tetralinoyl cardiolipin, which is cardiolipin that's made of four linoleic acid molecules, okay? Okay, so what does that mean? Um, cardiolipin with four, linoleic acid-rich cardiolipin is susceptible to oxidation, right? When it oxidizes, it can't function correctly anymore, right? The mitochondria, the key structure, a key structure, the electron transport chain in the mitochondria is composed of cardiolipin, right? If the cardiolipin gets oxidized, the electron transport chain ceases to function. Your, bot, your mitochondria can't produce power, and ultimately they break down, right? When they break down, they send a signal to the cell to kill itself, to commit suicide, ideally, which is a process known as apoptosis. Or if it's too extreme, it kills the cell and you have a process called necrosis, right? Which is basically uncontrolled cell death. What happens in necrosis is the contents of the cell get spilled out into your body and float around, you know, and they can detect that this is happening. What's the best way that they can detect this is happening? They do a test for oxidized cardiolipin. So these symptoms of oxidized cardiolipin in your blood and organ necrosis are signs that we see of severe disease states, right? Heart failure. You see oxidized cardiolipin in the blood and necrosis in the heart. Severe liver failure, you see the same, right? Um, the body interprets oxidized linoleic acid as a bacterial attack and mounts an autoimmune response. So oxidized omega-6 fats basically cause autoimmune responses in the body. Right. There are, you know, to kind of get a little off topic here from my reading, there are three, you know, there are essentially three known causes for autoimmune diseases. There's poison ivy, there's wheat and there are omega six fats. Not surprisingly, nobody eats poison. ivy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try that when I go home. Don't do that. <laughs> Amazingly, there are apparently like 20% of the population can eat poison ivy and not have a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> but don't try that one at home. That's just a bad idea. Um, so, yeah, so the omega-6 fats can cause an autoimmune reaction in the body, right? Which cause, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, right? So the oxidized cardiolipin, if you take... Um, Linoleic acid at physiological levels, meaning the amount you would find in a normal person, and you mix it with glucose, 
at the amount you would find in a normal person. And you stir it up in a beaker, right? What they call in vitro in these studies. Um, the glucose oxidizes the linoleic acid, producing some substances that are – there are many terms to refer to them in the uh, literature. The one I prefer to use is oxlams, which is oxidized linoleic acid metabolites, right? Two – there are three of them that are extremely well studied. Um, one of them is acrolane. Um, the other one is uh, 4-HNE, which is 4-hydroxynonanol. And the other one is MDA, maldonat, maldonat, maldonaldehyde. maldonaldehyde. Um, so what do these, these three chemicals share? They, acrolane is a biocide. It is interestingly the primary toxin that's found in cigarette smoke, which is interesting because it turns out that cooking with vegetable oils is a primary cause of lung cancer in China among women who don't smoke, right? HNE and MDA are both um, cytotoxins, meaning they kill cells, they're mutagens, meaning they cause mutations in DNA and they cause, well, just let's just leave it at that for now. They cause mutations in DNA, right? The primary type of mutation in most of the cancers that are known as Western cancers, lung disease, breast cancer, um, I think it's colon cancer and liver cancer, are all mutations that are caused by these oxalams, the breakdown products of omega-6 fatty acids, right? So we're starting to see that there's not only a bit of a experimental linkage in animals, which is nice, and there's some evidence of an epidemiological linkage, but there is an actual mechanistic linkage, right? These, these chemicals that are produced in the body from omega-6 fats can cause DNA damage. They are the leading cause of DNA damage in the body. Um, HNE preferentially modifies the P53 gene. The P53 gene is a gene that is crucial in defending the body against cancers. So in colon cancer and liver cancer, what we see is the P53 gene gets mutated and they can't mount a defense against the cancer process. And that is caused by HNE, which is only caused in the human body by the oxidation of omega-6 fats. Wow. <laughs> That's neat, isn't it? Oh, this is fascinating. Uh, why doesn't anybody else know about this? There's an enormous amount of research out there on it. Okay, this is the first time I'm hearing it. I'm, I must be living under yeah. the rock. Or is that just shoved under the carpet somehow? Well, what's fascinating about this, and I don't know entirely how to interpret this without going into conspiracy theories, <laughs> most of the research I've seen on this is from outside the United States or from second or third, third tier research institutes in the United States. Um, and on the non-conspiracy side of things, um, it was only discovered in, I think, the late 1980s by a European researcher, Hermann Esterbauer, that H&E was – so they were investigating H&E because it had clear involvement in the cancer process, but they didn't know where it came from. He was the guy who discovered that it comes from linoleic – excuse me, linoleic acid, Right. But that was in the 1990s. They didn't discover that it could be made endogenously in your mitochondria from linoleic acid until 2012. Right. So this is – now don't forget, these fats were introduced as a refined product into the human diet back in the late 1800s. So there's a huge gap between – when it seemed like a good idea to start eating this stuff. And when we started figuring out, uh-oh, this might be a problem. 
What about other diseases? How, other diseases. yeah, does it have an impact on those like heart disease or any other conditions? I'm totally just starting from scratch on this topic. So like, okay, I'm so just thinking while you're talking. Heart disease. Um, the gentleman who discovered um, the LDL receptor, right, which is this mechanism by which when they discovered it, what they thought it would do. So if you have heart disease, right, you have these uh, atherosclerotic plaques in your blood vessels, right? And most of the time what happens is the plaques grow until they either block off a blood vessel and cause a heart attack or they burst and the clot that forms causes the heart attack or causes a stroke or whatever, right? I mean, it was pretty well understood quite a while ago that that was kind of the process. The question was, why does this happen? So if you look at one of these plaques, they're full. It's like a, I mean, it's like a, a cyst, right, on the side of the artery with a somewhat hard shell on the outside. I mean, if you've ever had like a, you know, God help us, we've all done it. If you've ever had a zit and you squeezed it and pus comes out, that's basically what's happening inside of your arteries, right? You have these pustules forming with pus inside, um, which contains a bunch of different things, but one of the main ingredients is cholesterol. So, they, you know, the early hypothesis was that, okay, if you eat too much cholesterol, that's what causes it, but that only worked in rabbits and not even all that well. It didn't work in people, so they kind of gave up. That was, I mean, Ansel Keys, who is often painted as a villain in these topics, said in like the 1950s that cholesterol clearly doesn't cause heart disease, dietary cholesterol from like eggs or whatever, right? Which of course didn't cause, didn't stop the medical profession from telling people up until what last year not to eat egg yolks because they're high in cholesterol <laughs> but there was never any evidence for it except for in rabbits in you know the early 1900s so anyway so these two sci these two doctors slash scientists brown and goldstein um discovered the ldl receptor which allows cells to take up ldl cholesterol into the cells. And they said, aha, we found it. This explains what's going on, right? If we incubate these immune system cells called macrophages with LDL, they have LDL receptors. They will hoover up the LDL, puff up into what we call foam cells. And the foam cells will do all the rest of the things that we know happen in the atherosclerotic process, which will result in these big plaques and heart disease. Perfect. So what did they do? They took some LDL and they took some macrophages and they incubated them together. And the macrophages didn't eat, didn't take up any of the LDL. Didn't work. The hypothesis didn't work. Okay. So then there was another couple of scientists doctor slash scientists, uh, uh, Steinberg and Whitstam. Um, and, you know, there was a lot going on, but Steinberg's generally given the credit. He discovered that normal LDL isn't taken up by the macrophages. It has to be altered. It has to be oxidized, right? And when it's oxidized, the body basically interprets it as being damaged and then the macrophages will take it up through a separate receptor, not the LDL receptor. And then they will turn into foam cells. Ah, so this is interesting. Now we're actually looking at this disease process here, right? If we give macrophages normal LDL, they don't touch it. If we give them oxidized LDL, they eat it up and they turn into foam cells. And if you look inside the atherosclerotic plaques, most of the fats in there are oxidized fats right? And oxidized cholesterol. So we've got this nice picture forming. So what gets oxidized in the LDL? It's the polyunsaturated fatty acids, the omega-6 fatty acids. And they turn from linoleic acid into the chemical I mentioned before, HNE, 
the H and E alters the LDL so that the body interprets it as being a bacterial interloper and sucks it up and tries to dispose of it. Yeah. So, right, which starts to explain some of the experimental results in humans where you give humans a lot of polyunsaturated fats and their heart disease risk goes up. There are also a couple of studies that were done, one by Steinberg and Whitstam, another by a group of Spanish researchers where they changed the diet of people and they switched out polyunsaturated fatty acids for olive oil, which is mostly monounsaturated fatty acids. And then they tried to oxidize their LDL cholesterol and they, they discovered it's much more resistant, right? Because of all the fats, there's a spectrum, right? Saturated fats, the ones that are solid at room temperature, are the most resistant to oxidization. Monounsaturated fats, like oleic acid, the fat that's in uh, olive oil and is also one of your body's favorite fats to make, very resistant to oxidization. Polyunsaturated fats, like seed oils or fish oils, they oxidize just sitting there, right? You don't even need to do anything to them. Time will oxidize them. Time will oxidize them, air will oxidize them, light will oxidize them, glucose will oxidize them, right? They're very unstable. So, yeah, you have this spectrum, you know, if you look inside an atherosclerotic plaque, most of the fats in there are oxidized. Most of the polyunsaturated fats are oxidized and... You get back to, I mentioned before, necrosis, right? They're called necrotic lesions. The things that are in there are dying, and most likely why they're dying is because there are these polyunsaturated fatty acid-derived toxins that kill cells that are rich in these plaques, and that's what's causing the damage. So if you walk through the entire process of atherosclerosis, the ox lambs induce each step serially, right? They induce the macrophages to uptake LDL. They induce the macrophages to turn into foam cells. They induce the damage in the endothelium of the arteries. They induce the macrophages to, or the type of macrophage called a monocyte, to go through the arterial wall and start the process of trying to get these toxins out of the body, right? So essentially, the way to understand this process is it's an immune process, right? So now, Whitstam, um, Steinberg, God rest his soul, has been dead for quite a while. Whitstam continues to do the research. Um, and what he started trying to do was create antibodies that would take these um, oxidized fats and oxidized fat damaged proteins out of the body, right? So what did he discover? What he discovered was really fascinating. The antibodies would work against the oxidized LDL, but they would also work against lipopolysaccharides, which are uh, molecules that are found in bacteria and are a marker in the body of bacterial infection, right? So you could take the same antibody and it would, excuse me, work against either molecule, right? So what seems to be happening is the oxidized polyunsaturated fats, the body is interpreting this as being an infection and is reacting to it as an infection, right? So just like with poison ivy, what happens in poison ivy the urochiol, the oil in the poison ivy that causes the autoimmune infection, changes the proteins in your skin such that your body thinks it's an infection and your body tries to remove it. That's exactly what's happening in atherosclerosis. Wow. <laughs> wow. This is fascinating. You're leaving me with speechless at the same time. <laughs> 20 questions for every word that you're uttering. <laughs> it seems like these various different types of... Here's the thing. 
when someone told me about these different types of fats, I my hunch was that they can't all be the same when I started the ketogenic diet. There must be a difference. Why are they called different names? So that's why this is so enlightening in certain ways. And it seems like these various types of fats are various levels of decay of some sort or sort of alarms. Well, it's not so much decay. It's susceptibility to decay, right? Yeah. It's yeah. how easily are they damaged and what happens to them when they're damaged. So like back to the, you know, where we started, mitochondria with cardiolipin, if you replace the polyunsaturated fats in cardiolipin with monounsaturated or saturated fats, the cardiolipin don't oxidize and the damage doesn't happen. Right? It's, and it's an extremely fundamental process, right? The presence of HNE is something that mitochondria look for and react to as a sign that damage is about to happen. So what I th what I think is going on is that, you know, because polyunsaturated fats are, you know, found in all foods that I've ever looked at um, in some amount, right? So it's not like you can go on a zero PUFA diet. It's just not possible unless you eat like a lab rat. Um, but the problem is we've overwhelmed the compensating systems. And this is exactly what Steinberg and Whitstam wrote in 1991, a paper summarizing their research at that point. And they quoted Esterbrauer as saying, the cause of the oxidized LDL is an excess of polyunsaturated fatty acids beyond the body's antioxidant systems, beyond our ability to detoxify them. That's what causes the process. And I think that's spot on. So what's the role of omega-6s in general outside of human body? I mean, it looks like it's pretty chaotic for us and too much of it can pretty much override our defense mechanism of some sort and make us more susceptible. But what about other creatures? Do they benefit from it, like herbivores or scavengers or any of those kind of things? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, and there really isn't a great answer. There's some, there's some evidence that it's what they call, it's currently called an essential fatty acid, meaning that um, creatures can't survive without it, right? Um, so it definitely has important roles. The question is whether or not fats like omega-3 fats, DHA, can replace it or not. There's some evidence that says that they can. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at water or oxygen, they're both important for life, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you can get oxygen poisoning or water poisoning if you have too much, right? So the key is... And this is where, you know, my experience as a developer and a systems engineer came in is that the inputs are key, right? A system can only handle the inputs that it's experienced, right? In a human design system, it's what was it designed to handle? In an evolved system, it's what did it evolve to handle? So if you evolve, I mean, we clearly evolved without any doubt to handle a certain amount of omega-6 fatty acids, right? The most important antioxidant in the body is uh, glutathione, which for some mysterious reason, they, uh, the acronym is GSH. So if you have an animal that has a genetic GSH deficiency, it won't even live long enough to be born, right? It's a crucial antioxidant. And it's major, one of its major jobs is detoxifying these omega-6 fatty acid breakdown products right? So we are well evolved to live in an environment that has some amount of these omega-6 fatty acids. Okay. So what's one of the major symptoms of excess omega-6 fatty acid oxidation? It's um, when the GSH levels in the cell goes down. You can only produce so much. You can overwhelm the system. That's when you start seeing damage. Okay. So yeah, I mean, you know, the answer, what are they good for, is kind of tough to answer. The likely answer is a lot. They're found, you know, all throughout the plant kingdom, and they bioconcentrate, they bioaccumulate up through the animal kingdom. So, you know, 
the only animals that I'm aware of, um, the human brain seems to be designed to keep out linoleic acid and ruminants like cows or goats, the four, you know, the bacteria in their stomachs protect them from excess linoleic acid accumulation. But most other animals, you know, there's no rate limiter. It's not like, oh, we've, we've, we have too much. We have to cut back on it. Like if you drink too much water, you throw up, right? That doesn't happen with omega-6 fatty acids. They just, there's no, there's no, I don't think we ever encountered a situation like where we are now, where we have these huge amounts of omega-6 fatty acids in the food chain. The body doesn't know what to do with it. I see. Why do we even have these different kinds of fats? I know it's a very general question, but you might have thought about it. And for that yeah, reason, fine. why do we have different kinds of carbs and proteins? You have an hour. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it. I, I posted a tweet a while ago that said macronutri macronutrients are useless, right? There are good proteins and bad proteins. There are good fats and bad fats. There are good carbohydrates and bad carbohydrates. Right. I don't particularly and there are interactions between all of them. So I don't find, you know, that said, going on a low carb diet and especially a low carb, low omega six diet is probably the best way to resolve the chronic diseases that so many people are suffering from nowadays. I think that the reason a low carb diet works is because a lot of the carbs that people get are from junk food. And if you look at what, what are the actual ingredients of junk food, it's pretty consistently carbohydrates from starch and sugar and omega-6 fatty acids, right? Just read the ingredients, right? Like corn chips. What are corn chips? Corn, soybean oil. So I don't think – I think the benefit um, – that's a crucial interaction. I think by cutting back on carbohydrates – you automatically in the modern food environment cut back on omega-6 fatty acids and that – but I think that a lot of the benefit comes from cutting back on the omega-6 fatty acids because there are lots of cultures that eat a lot of carbohydrates that are extremely healthy like the Japanese for instance. Right. Yeah. So while I myself eat low carb, you know, in and out of ketogenesis all the time. And, you know, I, I feel better doing it that way and I prefer it that way. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily – I don't think it's necessary from – based on the evidence I've seen in a person who's growing up in a given environment, right? I mean the Japanese have been eating a high-carb diet for hundreds of years and have been renowned for having long lifespans for the same length of time. Yeah, what's up with these Japanese? What's going on with those guys? I mean, you've, I think you've mentioned it in the blog post with Break Nutrition, great podcast, free plug. Um, so what's up with them? Why do well, they, so yeah. The Japanese, I mean, if you're going to compare any two groups of people to try and figure out what's going on with the problem of the modern American diet, the Japanese and the Americans are two terrific examples, right? The first reason is that Japan, unlike a lot of Asia and unlike a lot of the entire world, industrialized very early, right? But they didn't abandon their traditional diet until after World War II, right? So if you look at, you know, an American versus a Katavan, Tavins had a high carb diet, no disease, but they also lived in, you know, this almost a hunter gatherer, hunter gatherer lifestyle. So there's all sorts of confounders. What was their infection rate? What was their disease rate? Were they more active than us? You know, you can go on and on and on with all this stuff. Japanese are extremely industrialized. They live in a big city, bigger city than any city we have in America. Yet they eat a completely different diet from what Americans eat, right? So looking at the differences between what they ate and what we eat and their health and our health 
And most importantly, what happened in the island of Okinawa after World War II tells you, I think, an enormous amount about what's behind these different diseases and points fingers at what is an optimal diet, which is really what we all want to know at the end of the day. Awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and in a nutshell, they started on a very high carb, low meat, high salt, low omega-6 diet and were very healthy, but, right, a couple problems with the Japanese diet. Um, and we can get into that in a couple of minutes. Then they, World War II happened happened and the longest lived population in Japan was in the island of Okinawa, right? Okinawans ate more meat than all the rest of the Japanese, right? They didn't eat as much rice, but they ate lots of yams. Some, um, okay, interesting. So after World War II, the Americans decided to make Okinawa their base of operations, build a lot of bases, bring in a lot of American personnel who don't want to eat the Japanese diet. So they start opening up junk food locations, fast food locations in Okinawa. The first fast food restaurant in Japan was opened in Okinawa nine years before it was opened in Tokyo. Okay. So what happened to the Okinawans in like everybody else on earth, they decided they really liked American fast food and they started eating a lot of it. And their life expectancy in a single generation between the parents and the children, their life expectancy went from the highest in Japan to the lowest in Japan in one generation. Now, what causes that? That's an amazing change. One of the things, however, here is – this is what I've thought a few times – is that yams, if you eat them cold, they're, aren't they just practically resistant starch and they really don't do anything? Yeah, but they don't eat them cold. They oh. cook them. Okay. So yeah. this brings us to an interesting topic, veganism. Is that a viable solution without well, the omega-6s? I... Okay, back to Japan. Uh, the vegans, yeah, well, the Japan's a neat solution to that argument because the, um, vegans like to point to Okinawa and say, oh, we should eat like the Okinawans. They were nearly vegan, right? And they had the longest life expectancies in Japan. Okay, fine. First off, the studies that looked at the Okinawans didn't include explicitly the meat portion of the diet. They just excluded it because they ate it at these festivals. Every so often they would have a festival. And what did they eat at the festival? Pork, right? Okinawa is known in Japan as the island of pork. They had a higher meat intake than any of the rest of Japan and the longest life expectancy. So now, now if – okay, fine. That's interesting. The longest lived people in Japan had the highest meat intake. Great. So what happened since then? As the Okinawan life expectancy declined, the Japanese government instituted a program to make Japanese eat more meat because they looked at the Japanese and they looked at Americans. Americans ate lots of meat. They were much bigger. They were you know, physically bigger, physically stronger. Um, there was actually a Japanese – a uh, politician who said, if we eat meat for a thousand years, we'll all be tall and blonde like the Americans. So this was like a major policy in Japan to get Japanese to eat more meat after World War II. So they would be bigger and stronger. And it worked, right? They got taller, which is a typical side effect. You know, the biggest problem with a high carb diet is malnutrition, which results in short stature, Right. Japanese were tiny. A lot of them are still tiny. Um, my daughter, who's five feet, one inches, is now living in Japan, and she's thrilled because she's average height over there, whereas she was always one of the smallest people in her class here in the United States. Um, so what happened to the rest of Japan? Okinawa started eating American food. They all started dying. Their life expectancy went down to the bottom of the charts. 
the rest of the Japanese start eating more meat and their life expectancy skyrocketed, right? So then these guys, these Japanese scientists said, okay, well, let's look at, let's look at what Japanese centenarians, you know, people who are a hundred years or older eat. What's, what can we learn? And lo and behold, they didn't find a single in all of Japan, the longest lived nation in the world, or in Okinawa held up as the example of the plant-based diet, they did not find a single centenarian who was a vegetarian, not one. <laughs> what they did find was that the more meat and milk, oddly enough, which is a whole nother topic, that Japanese elderly people ate, the longer they lived. So yes, bury veganism out back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we we call Dr. Gregor, and uh, you can call us haters. We call him Omega Six Prime or Dr. Oxalate, and Professor Talks, and we got some names for him. Um, so here's uh, I had a question, and I've I've just been like lost in your stories, man. <laughs> They're amazing. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. So fat does not come on its own. It always comes with something else. How does, as a whole food, something impact the body rather than just fat on its own? Because everything has different types of fats. Like, let's say if I were to consume the same amount of fat types and amount from pork versus another animal source, would they have a different response? Would there be some changes in there? I hope that's getting through. No, that's a great question. Um, and a lot of that, A, depends on what did we evolve to eat, and B, what are we feeding the animals that we're eating, right? So I mentioned that ruminants don't, are protected against excess omega-6 fat composition. Um, monogasts, single stomached animals like us, or chickens, or pigs aren't. We don't have a rate limiter on how much omega-6 fats we absorb. So the more we eat, the more we will absorb, and the higher the percentage in our body fat and body tissues will be, right? Um, but you also have to look at, I mean, if anybody asks me what I eat, I tell them it's the paleo diet, because I think that's still the best um, model that we have. Um, but unlike a lot of people, I think the paleo diet is primarily a ketogenic diet, right? So one of the interesting things that I've learned in the last year or so from, in part, with the help of a fellow named George Henderson, is omega-6 fats are almost a marker of health, but not how you would expect them to be, right? If they turn into toxins in the body, then the assumption is that having less of them is going to be better for you, right? So let's say you take somebody and you put them on a low fat, or a, I'm sorry, a low carb diet. What happens to their omega six fat levels? Would you think they're going to get they get healthier, right? Their markers of chronic disease get better. So what happens to their omega six fat markers? Care to guess? Down. They go up. What? They go up. They go up. Right. Very surprising. At first, the reason they go up is that the damage process slows down. Right? So what you see in multiple different pathological states, the best study I've seen was on acute respiratory distress syndrome, where they showed in patients in vivo in a hospital setting, the omega-6 fats in their serum converting into HNE and causing damage in the body. So their omega-6 fat levels were going down, the toxin levels were going up. So if you stop that process, the omega-6 fat levels go up Finian Volek, of all people, did a study that showed this. 
right? Because you're stopping the damage process. So there's this interplay, right? So if you look at a natural human diet, they would probably have somewhat high omega-3, omega-6 levels, but they're not eating any carbohydrates or almost no carbohydrates. How do we know that they weren't eating any carbohydrates? Because carbohydrates cause cavities. And if you look at the paleo, paleolithic fossils and skulls that we have, they have no cavities, right? So in anthropology, the marker of when a population starts eating carbs is when did they start getting cavities? And for two odd million years, there were no, all, virtually no cavities, and then all of a sudden everybody gets cavities. Why? Because they start eating carbohydrates. And that's, you know, the important thing to remember to your question about the different components is that they interact with each other, right? So if you eat more omega-6 fats and then you eat a lot of carbs on top of it, that's like the double whammy because the, you know, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, if you mix glucose and linoleic acid in a beaker, the glucose oxidizes the linoleic acid. That seems to happen in the body too. Okay. A lot of synergistic poisoning going on, I suppose. Um, right. So can but, we, Go ahead. But the flip side of that is if you're Katavan or Japanese and you eat a high-carb diet but it's really, really low in omega-6, you also don't have any of these problems. So there's a counterbalance, which is why I don't think – Simply recommending people to eat a low-carb diet is – it works. It's effective. It will improve your health. But it's not really the cause of the thing unless you're also eating high omega-6. So the double prong would be for a low-carb diet, cut refined sugars and uh, processed carbs and also reduce the uh, processed oils. So that now makes perfect sense. Right. Okay. Right. And it and if you look at the start of the process, if you look at dental health, the marker, they use basically three markers now for dental disease, right? Dan Lieberman, the chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University and one of the most well-renowned anthropologists in the world said, look, if your teeth aren't well evolved to a diet, it's unlikely that the rest of your body would be. So look at what happens in people's mouths, right? The worst thing for your teeth is sucrose. And one of the things they use to track um, cavities in the teeth is sucrase, the enzyme that breaks down sucrose, because you can't make it in your mouth. You make it in your stomach. So if you have sucrase in your mouth, it means that there are bacteria that are breaking down the sucrose in your mouth and using those acids to rot your teeth, right? Starch, same thing. The bacteria in your mouth convert starch, output acids, that's what rots your teeth. Now, what they found out recently that's fascinating is the oxalans also cause damage in your mouth, right? The omega-6 breakdown products cause damage. So those three things, this isn't rocket science, those three things rot your face. Take them out of your diet. Guess what? Everything else will get better. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's the thing, though. Like you said earlier, everything has omega-6s. Do we have any or is there ways that you could quantify mins and maxes for omega-6s per person? Or is that just going to be so subjective based on genetic factors or environmental factors, their activity levels and... It seems like, I don't know, can you bring order out of chaos? Well, I don't really, I honestly don't. Okay, so less is better. None may be bad, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so, but let's look at the changes that occurred in the human diet, right? We started growing a lot of grains. There are some high omega-6 fat grains like wheat and corn and interestingly brown rice but not white rice um probably best off to avoid those right um definitely avoid any of the refined oils from seeds right 
The problem is the fats bioaccumulate, right, like a toxin, like DDT. So you also have to be wary of animals that are fed lots of grains, like pigs or chickens, right? There was a great study done by an associate of Ramsden where they took, you know, they now farm salmon, right? And one of the things that they feed the salmon is soybean oil, God help us. So they took salmon, they fed them soybean oil, and then they fed the ground up salmon to mice or rats or whatever. And they looked at them and the mice had all the negative effects that they would have had if they'd eaten soybean oil directly. Right? So those are my guidelines, basically. Avoid grains, avoid seed oils like the plague, and minimize consumption of animals that are fed lots of grains and seed oils, which is basically pigs and chickens in our diet. Um, how are omega-6s created and planned? I mean, there has to be a cycle where all of this begins. That's an excellent question. I don't know the answer to that. They, they are create, they, animals can't create them. They are created in plants and they bio, just like omega-3 fats and they bioaccumulate up through the food chain. Okay. And, uh, is there a way besides, I guess the diet of the animal would fluctuate the amount of omega-6s in, uh, their composition as well. So I would imagine the same thing happens to them. Like for example, if a cow has a lot of omega-6 intake, they might be prone to cancer as well. Just well, that's, cow, cows are, that's an excellent question. Cows are ruminants. The bacteria that are in their rumen um, pre-process – here's a fascinatingly little wrinkle. They pre-process the linoleic acid in the plants into conjugated linoleic acid, CLA. CLA appears to have anti-cancer properties. And from some of the research I've seen, it appears that the reason it has anti-cancer properties is because it blocks the uptake of linoleic acid in the body, <laughs> right? So if you're going to eat meat, ideally eat grass-fed or pastured. If you can't, eat cows, you know, lamb, goats, ruminants, right, um, and minimize the amount of pigs and chickens that you're eating. And we'll just put all the religious issues to the side. We're just talking pure nutrition here. What should you be eating? Eat dairy fat. Dairy? Right? Because dairy fat. Because dairy fat has a really good mixture of different fatty acids, long chain, short chain, even chain, odd chain. All these different attributes of the fats make differences to your health. So – what you want, back to the paleo thing, is what would a paleolithic person have been encountering in their diet? They wouldn't have been eating much in the way of carbohydrates. They wouldn't have been encountering much grains, right? The omega-6 fats they would have been getting mostly from animals, mostly from ruminants, because that's apparently what we evolved to do is to hunt down ruminants, right? So our, you know... You're trying to get – you can't – because the problem is it's almost impossible to know the omega-6 or omega-3 fat levels in most foods. So you can't go crazy over it because you can't track it. You've got to use some broad guidelines to try and get you down to a healthy level. And then, you know, what I do, I, if I don't sunburn, I'm pretty happy with life. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, one of the big markers is, is gingivitis, Right. I mean, I, I mentioned that I cut sugar out when I was in my, um, when I was 18 or 19 and I'm 50 now, right? I've had one cavity in 31 or 32 years. And that was when they put out a sugar bowl or a candy bowl at the office. And I started eating mints for a while, got a cavity exactly where I would suck on the mint in my mouth. Um, so... Oh, I had a point there. I lost my point. I'm going to ask a question while you're thinking. Go ahead. So people think dairy is awful. Is there a counter argument to that besides the, just this one? Uh, 
dairy awful. Okay, that's a long time. So my point was gingivitis. So anyway, gingivitis for me is a marker of omega-6 intake. If I have seed oils, my gums start to bleed. When I stopped eating them, my gums, which had been bleeding for years, stopped. Wow. So that's a pretty, for me, that's a pretty immediate marker of my dietary quality, right? Okay, dairy. There's not, look, there are some people who have an allergic reaction to dairy. My daughter's one of them, right? Um, you can have a problem. I don't think that lactose intolerance exists. Um, I found a number of great studies. You know, I like to go back to the basics on this stuff, right? So there are a number of traditional populations that, you know, like the Maasai famously, but it, there are a couple of um, Asian and Chinese populations that eat a lot of dairy. Do they have lactose intolerance? Right? Okay. People have looked at this. 60% of the Maasai, the Maasai eat a very dairy intensive diet. 60% of the Maasai are lactose intolerant. And yet they're remarkably healthy on a high dairy diet. How is that possible? Right? In northern India, there's what's known as the celiac belt. Northern India is where most of the wheat is eaten in India, and southern India tends to be rice and other grains. So the celiac belt also has, tends to have high levels of lactose intolerance. And what seems to be happening is that the wheat is damaging the small intestine and damages the ability of the intestine to process lactose and dairy. So when I discovered my daughter was lactose intolerant, it was around about the time we were putting the family on a wheat-free diet, and her lactose intolerance basically went away. And then she started cheating, as teenagers will, and her lactose intolerance came back. So I think this is another synergy between different elements in the diet, where if you don't understand what's going on, it's difficult to, you know, it's difficult to suss out the interrelations. But... There are a bunch of healthy dairy dependent societies around the world who, with high levels of lactose intolerance, like up to the 90 percentile level, who nevertheless are healthy and strong and vibrant on a high dairy diet. So, you know, lactose intolerance isn't a great marker for dairy. So, yeah, if you're damaged and you can't, you know, if you're damaged, you can't digest dairy, then don't eat dairy. I haven't seen any evidence that there's anything that's fundamentally wrong with dairy as a food. I was raised in a country in pa called Pakistan, and over there, dairy was a... I've heard of Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, try not to go you're, there too often. You're up, the, you're up in the celiac belt. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun country. Maybe one day when I delve into controversial issues publicly, I will bring that to these topics back up. <laughs> well, my... My best man at my uh, wedding, his father was born in Lahore, although they were Hindu. So I've got some familiarity with the country. Maybe one day under, under the table, we'll talk about it more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, well, you, go ahead. You should look at those Malhotra studies, by the way, because a lot of the people he looked at were, you know, up in that area. A lot of the research he did was looking at... Um, I don't know if it was Pakistan because some of it was later, but he was looking at, you know, the people on the Indian side of the border who were have similar habits to the Pakistanis. Yes, and and it seems very odd for someone who's always had a third person outsider perspective on this Western culture to see a lot of these intolerances that are out there. Maybe they're just not visible in my country or other countries over there. So it's 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 fascinating. I, that's all I have to say. It is. Well, yeah, it, it is, although some of them definitely do exist in India, but, you know, they have to, they tend to have different presentations depending on, just like they do in Japan or other countries, depending on, you know, if there are different elements in the diet that are having different effects and different interplays between them, then different cultures are going to have different presentations based on which elements they have and what proportions.
Okay. okay. So, so here's a selfish question for yeah. since we make products at the same time, how do fats change over time? How do they decay and die away? And how is shelf stability and all those factors affected by uh, time? It's uh, saturated, long chain saturated fat, fatty acids are the most resistant to breakdown. Um, I once bought a five gallon tub of beef tallow from a company called US Wellness, and I kept it unrefrigerated in my basement for years. And I would occasionally go down and cook with it, and I had to use a chisel to get the fat out. What? It was like soap, it was the consistency of a bar of soap. Right, you couldn't use a spoon. I literally had to use a hammer and a chisel. One year I went down and there was some mold on top, so I sc scraped that off since I had the chisel. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept using the fat. It was incredibly stable. Um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, if you put them on the shelf, they are going bad every day. Okay. Right. Olive oil tends to last longer you know it's just it's again a spectrum based on how saturated the fats are and how long the chains are the fats are the two major variants from what i've read so the longer so, the chain the longer right right and the scary bit is um if you compare omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids omega-3 fatty acids when they go rancid People can tell, right? It's rotten fish. Everybody knows you don't eat rotten fish, right? Omega-6 fatty acids don't have, and this is, I think, a piece of evidence that they were fairly rare in our diet. People don't have the same negative reaction to them. In fact, people find them somewhat appealing. So even though they're 50 to 100 times as toxic as rancid omega-3 fatty acids, people don't have the same revulsion reaction. They taste a little off and a little stale, which is why the food industry likes to use them, right? <laughs> Imagine potato chips made with fish oil, for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, you open up the bag and it smells like rancid fish, right? That's not a win. If you do it with seed oil, if you open up the bag and it's gone bad, it'll smell a little stale, but it's not. But people will still eat it. And people tend to like that. Uh, unless they're fish chips? Some British people somewhere? Well, again, you know, fish chips go bad quick. Nobody eats them. Yeah. <laughs> fish, fish jerky isn't really much of a thing for good reason. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. A product, you want to focus on um, saturated fatty acids and uh, monounsaturated fatty acids and minimize the poofas as much as possible, which is what the food industry does. Yeah, they right. maximize the PUFAs. Right. Well, no, 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 no. They minimize the PUFAs. That was the oh. whole point of hydrog hydrogenating fats. Is by hydrogenating the PUFAs, you make them saturated fats and they don't go rancid. Awesome. So let's say you're made the president of the universe and you were to design a diet. What would you do? If I was going to design a diet, well, that would be easy. I would cut out, you know, 90% of sugar and probably 95% of seed oils. And wheat, wheat's tough because some people like myself have a really bad reaction to it. And some people don't seem to be bothered by it. I think that part of the problem with wheat may be the other factors in the diet, like the seed oils. Um, but I would definitely put a big warning label on wheat, cut sugar way back, cut um, seed oils way back and put a big warning sign on wheat and try and stimulate meat production as much as possible. Awesome. Awesome. So what are some of the paradoxes besides the million that you've already talked about on this podcast that uh, we might have missed out on or you think are important to bring here? Paradoxes. <laughs> That's one of my favorite topics. So there's the American po paradox, right? Why did obesity go up as we introduced low-fat foods? There's the French paradox. Why do they have lower heart disease rates when they eat far more saturated fats than Americans or anybody else in Europe? There's the Israeli paradox, which is 
why do Israelis who eat a high carb, high omega-6 diet have higher rates of cancer and heart disease than any place else? What I think is that recognizing the effect of omega-6 fats and some of the interplays resolves a lot of those paradoxes, right? You have the Katavan paradox or the Japanese paradox, high carb diet, yet they're healthy, no signs of chronic disease. Yeah, we've pretty much effed up our country with, and, and if you see a lot of foods, they'll say reduced saturated fats, less saturated fats, heart healthy because there's less saturated fats. <laughs> yeah. Oops. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we're well, go ahead. Two, two more quick points. Um, Peter at the hyperlipid blog did an awesome post comparing trans fats to linoleic acids. Um, and it was based on a study that was done in response to a blog post that Chris Masterjohn did a number of years ago. So you want a little, you want to screw up. This is the perfect screw up, right? So if you compare trans fats directly against linoleic acid, it turns out that linoleic acid is far worse for you, right? So when they did the studies that were originally pointing the finger at saturated fats, they didn't use beef tallow, they used Crisco. And what is Crisco made from? <laughs> Seed oils. And what does it contain a lot of? Linoleic acid, which is worse than the trans fats in the Crisco. So what they may, those studies may well have been tracking. Unfortunately, they're so confounded by bad data that it's impossible to tell. What they may have been tracking was the introduction of seed oils into the diet, ultimately. Um, the other interesting thing, um, it turns out that the most common genetic, call it defect or abnormality in humanity is a defect in processing alcohol and in processing alcohol in Asians, right? Everybody's heard of this. It's the Asian flush gene, the ALDH2.2 asterisk 2 mutation. So if you've ever known a Chinese person or a Japanese person who drinks alcohol and they flush red, that means they, they have this genetic inability to detoxify alcohol, right? Well, it turns out that that same genetic defect means that they are unable to detoxify omega-6 fats because the same enzyme detoxifies omega-6 fatty acid oxidation products and alcohol. Okay, that's interesting. So then let's go look at this same group of people. They all have a higher rate of these chronic diseases than other people who don't have this genetic variation. Sounds like a curse. You can't go to the bars. You can't become a vegan. You well, gotta... the plus side is apparently the rate of alcoholism w amongst people with this genetic uh, variance is zero because drinking alcohol is so unpleasant for them. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there's a silver lining in everything, right? That's fascinating. Um, I've personally never found alcohol that appealing I mean, maybe this, I'm just an N equals to one. Is this, I would have, is this cultural or is this genetic? Is it an environmental? What's up with it's that? It's genetic. It's genetic. It's a 3000 year old mutation that about, I think 8% of the six, six or 8% of the human population has almost all the mutation started in the Chinese population and spread throughout, um, people descended from that. So American Indians have it, Japanese have it, like 50%, Koreans. Awesome. Wow. Dude, we just knocked it out of the park with this show, by the way. Like, this is just filled with, yeah, this is just filled with paradoxes and strange new information, the grounds we've never treaded on. <laughs> Do you have more magic in your, in, in, the, in your mysterious bag? Well, like I said, we could go on for when you and the pre-call, pre-show discussion when you went through your list of uh, questions, I said we could go on for weeks. 
Now you see what I'm talking about. Oh, this is amazing. You're going to be back pretty soon and we can continue this journey. I think this will be enough for people to digest. What do you think? I think we've probably hit the limit here. It's been, boy, almost an hour and a half, right? Yep. An hour and a half. An hour and a half it is. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for listening to me <laughs> rant for so okay. long. Okay. <laughs> It's two, been a great talk. The two final questions, though. Uh, when should people reach out to you and how should people reach out to you? Uh, well, I'm very active on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Tucker Goodrich. It's really complicated. Um, my Twitter profile has a link to my blog, which is called Yelling Stop, uh, yellingstop.blogspot.com. Um, and I monitor the discussions there and try and post as often as I can. I've got a couple of thousand different posts there at this point, so there's a lot of information up there. What is it about? Uh, barefoot running and diet. Barefoot running's what got me into this whole thing, oddly enough. That's fascinating. We just did a, a podcast with Peter Jefty, and then there's a Zach Bitter one coming out too, so fun yeah, stuff. My most, my most popular post ever was uh, about Zach Bitter back in, I think, 2012 looking at his diet and Zach commented a lot on, you know, clarifying things. It was a great post. He's a fascinating guy. Yeah. He's a really fascinating, really cool and, and a genuinely good person. And he's going to be by this, by the time this podcast comes out, he's already going to be on there. So you're next. Great. Well, I will definitely look that one up because I love hearing what he has to say. All right, fantastic, Tucker. Uh, thank you for being on the show while still being outside Starbucks and doing this podcast in partial darkness. You look like Godfather <laughs> right now, if anybody actually saw the picture <laughs> that I'm seeing. <laughs> so thank you. Great talking to you, Fahad. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the show. You can visit us at KetoGeek.com to check out our premium keto-friendly and low-carb food products, including our infamous energy pods, made from the best ingredients we could find in the entire country. We also recommend signing up for our newsletter at KetoGeek.com slash signup, where you get exclusive discounts, rewards, product announcements, and the latest content we are working on. You also get a 10% discount on your entire order when you sign up. Go to ketogeek.com slash signup to join the low-carb playground. <laughs>